Drink it, my dear. I don't feel much like it. Perhaps you'd like a drop of vodka. No. I don't drink vodka every day. <laughs> Besides, it's so sultry. <laughs> now, how many years have we known each other? How many? Hmm. Lord, help my memory. You came into these parts when? Vera Petrovna Sonyachka's mother was living then. When you came to see us two winters before she died. Well, that must be 11 years ago. Maybe even more. Have I changed much since then? Very much. You were young and handsome in those days. Now you've grown older. And you're not so good looking. There's another thing, too. You take a drop of vodka now. Yes. In ten years, I've become a different man. And what's the reason for it? I'm overworked, nurse. From morning till night, I'm always on my legs. Never a moment of rest. And at night, one lies under the bedclothes in continual terror of being dragged out to a patient. In all these years that you've known me, I've not had one free day. I may well look old. Life itself. It's tedious. Stupid. Dirty. This life swallows one up completely. And none but odd people about one. They're an odd lot, all of them. And after one has lived amongst them for two or three years, by degrees, one turns odd too without noticing it. It's inevitable. <laughs> what a huge moustache I've grown. Eh? <laughs> <That is> stupid <laughs> moustache. <laughs> I've turned into a queer fish now. Hmm? Well, I've not grown stupid yet, thank God. My brains are in the right place, but my feelings are somehow blunted. There's nothing I want. Nothing I care about. No one I'm fond of. Mm. Except you, perhaps. I'm fond of you. Had a nurse like you when I was a child. Perhaps you'd like something to eat. Hmm? <laughs> no. <laughs> In the third week of Lent, I went to Malitsko, where there was an epidemic. Spotted typhus. In the huts, the people were lying about in heaps. There was filth, stench, smoke. Calves on the ground with the sick, little pigs about to. I was hard at work all day. I didn't sit down for a minute. I'd had a morsel of food. And when I got home, they wouldn't let me rest. They brought me a signalman from the line. I laid him on the table to operate on him. He went and died under the chloroform. Just when they weren't wanted, my feelings seemed to wake up again and I felt his conscience stricken as though I'd killed him on purpose. I sat down, closed my eyes like this, and thought, those who will live after us in a hundred or two hundred years' time, for whom we are struggling now to beat out a road, Will they remember and say a good word for us? Hmm? <laughs> Nurse, they won't, you know. Man will not remember, but God will remember. Thank you for that. That's a nice saying. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Had a good sleep? Yes, very well. Ever since the professor and his wife have been here, our life has been turned topsy-turvy. I, I sleep at the wrong times. At lunch and dinner, I eat the wrong sort of food. I, I drink wine. Well, it's not good for me. Oh, in the old days, I never had a free moment. Sonia and I both used to work in grand style, but now... Sonia works alone, and I 
Sleep and eat and drink. Bad. Such goings on. The professor gets up at 12 o'clock and the samovar's boiling all the morning waiting for him. Before they came, we always had dinner about one o'clock like other people. Now they are here, we have it between six and seven. The professor spends his night reading and writing. And all at once at two o'clock in the morning, he rings his bell. Goodness me, what is it? Tea. <laughs> people have to be waking out of their sleep to get in the <laughs> samovar. <laughs> That's going on. <laughs> Will they be here much longer? A hundred years. The professor has made up his mind to settle here. Well, look now, the samovar's been on the table this two hours and they've gone for a walk. No, they're uh, coming. Uh, they're coming. Don't, don't fuss. A lovely, lovely, exquisite views. <laughs> Quite remarkable, Your Excellency. We'll go to the plantation tomorrow, Father, shall we? What? Look, tea is ready. Oh, my friends, be so kind as to send my tea into the study for me. I have something more I must do today. I know you like the plantation, Father. It's hot, it's stifling. Now, a great man of learning has on his overcoat and galoshes, with an umbrella and gloves, too. Takes care of himself, anyway. <laughs> How lovely she is, huh? How lovely. I've never seen a more beautiful woman. Whether I drive through the fields, Marina, or walk in a shady garden, or look at this table, I feel unutterably joyful. The weather is enchanting, the birds are singing, and we are all living in peace and concord. What more could one wish for? Oh, I am truly grateful to you. Her, her eyes. An exquisite woman. <laughs> Well, tell us something, Banya. What shall I tell you? Is there nothing new? <laughs> no. No, everything's old. No, I'm just as I always was, perhaps worse, because now I've grown lazy. I do nothing but just grumble like some old crow. And my old magpie, Mama, is still babbling about the rights of women. With one foot in the grave, she's still rummaging in her learned books for the dawn of a new life. The, the professor. The professor? Mm -hmm. As before, sits in his study from morning till dead of night, writing. With furrowed brows and racking brains, we write and write and write, and ne'er a word of praise we hear our labors to requite. <laughs> oh, one feels sorry for the paper that he writes on. <laughs> no, he'd do better to write his autobiography. But what a superb subject. A retired professor, you know, an old dry as dust, a learned fish. Gout, rheumatism, migraine. And envy and jealousy have affected his liver. The old fish is living on his first wife's estate. Living here, against his will, because he can't afford to live in the town. He's forever complaining about his misfortunes. As a matter of fact, he's extremely fortunate. Well, just think how fortunate. The son of a humble sacristan, he has risen to university distinctions, the chair of a professor. He's known as Your Excellency, the son-in-law of a, of a senator, and so on and so on. All that doesn't matter. Oh, but just listen to this. This man has been writing and lecturing about art for 25 years, and he knows absolutely nothing about art. <laughs> Years he's been chewing over other men's ideas about realism, naturalism, and all sorts of nonsense. So for 25 years he's been writing and lecturing about things that intelligent people know already and the stupid ones aren't interested in anyway. So for 25 years he's simply been wasting his time. But with all that, what conceit, what pretentiousness. He, he's retired and not a living soul knows anything about him. He's absolutely unknown. So, for 25 years, all he's done is to keep a better man out of a job. <laughs> oh, just look at him. I mean, he struts around like a turkey cock. <laughs> I believe you're envious. Yes, I am. And the success he has had with women. Oh, Don Juan isn't in it. Oh, his first wife, my sister. It's a lovely, gentle creature. 
as pure as this blue sky, noble, generous, with more admirers than he has had pupils. Loved him as only pure angels can love beings as pure and beautiful as themselves. My mother adores him to this very day. He still arises in her a feeling of devout awe. His second wife, you've just seen her, young, intelligent, beautiful, musical. Married him in his old age. He sacrificed her youth, her beauty, her freedom, her radiance to, to him. Him? What for? Why? Hmm. Is she uh, faithful to the professor? Yeah, well, unhappily, she is. <laughs> Why unhappily? Well, because her fidelity is false from beginning to end. Oh, there's plenty of fine sentiment in it, but no logic. To deceive an old husband whom one can't endure is immoral. But, but to try and stifle one's youth, one's vitality, one's capacity to feel, that's, that's not immoral. Sonia, I can't bear to hear you talk like that. Come now, really. Anyone who can betray wife or husband is a person who cannot be trusted, who might betray his country. Oh, dry up, poor fools. Excuse me, Vanya. My wife ran away from me with the man she loved the day after our wedding on the ground of my unprepossessing appearance. But I have never been false to my vows. I love her to this day and am faithful to her. I help her as far as I can. And to bring up her children by the man she loved, I gave all that I had. I may have lost my happiness, but my pride has been left me. And she, poor soul, her youth is over. Her beauty, in accordance with the laws of nature, has faded. The man she loves is dead. Now what has she left? Nurse, darling, some peasants have come. Go and speak to them. Maria Vasilievna. I'll look after the tea. Yeah. I've come to see your husband. You wrote to me that he was very ill. Rheumatism and something else. But it appears he's perfectly well. Last night he was poorly, complaining of pains in his legs, but today he's all right. <laughs> and I've galloped 20 miles at breakneck speed. There, it doesn't matter. It's not the first time it's happened to me. I shall stay with you till tomorrow to make up for it. Anyway, I shall get a good night's sleep. Oh, that's splendid. It's not often you stay the night with us. I expect you've not had dinner. No, I haven't. Well, you can have it with us, then. We have dinner now between six and seven. Oh, oh this tea is cold. The temperature in the samovar has perceptibly dropped. Oh, never mind, Ivan Ivanich. We will drink it cold. I beg your pardon, I am not Ivan Ivanich, but Ilya Ilyich. Ilya Ilyich Telyegin. Or as some people call me on account of my pockmarked face, Waffles. I stood godfather to Sonyeshka. His Excellency, your husband, and his wife, Vera Petrovna, knew me well, you see. I live here now and live on your estate. If you have been so kind as to observe it, I have dinner with you every day. Ilya, Ilya is our helper. Oh. He is our right hand. Come, Godfather, let me give you another glass. Ah, what is it, Grandmama? I forgot to tell Alexandre. I'm losing my memory. I got a letter today from Harkov, from Pavel Alexeyevich. He has sent his new pamphlet. Is it interesting? It is interesting, but it is rather queer. He is attacking what he himself maintained seven years ago. It is awful. There's nothing awful about it. <laughs> Just drink your tea, Mama. But I want to talk. Oh, but we've been talking and talking for 50 years and reading pamphlets. Isn't it about time to stop? You do not like listening when I speak. I do not know why. Forgive me for saying so, Jean, but you have changed so much in the course of the last year that I hardly know you. You used to be a man of definite principles, of elevating ideas. Oh, yes, I was a man of elevating ideas, which elevated nobody. A man of elevating ideas. You, you could hardly have made a more malignant joke. Look, I'm 47. Now, until last year, I tried, like you, to blind myself with all your pedantic rubbish in order to avoid seeing life as it really is. I thought I was doing the right thing. But now... If you only knew, I, I, I can't sleep for vexation, for rage. When, when I think of all the time I've wasted, when I might have had everything from which my age now shuts me out. Uncle Vanya, it's so crazy. You 
thing to be blaming your former principles. Yeah. It is not they that are to blame. It is yourself. Mm. You forget that principles alone are no use. Yes, yes. A dead letter. You want to be working. What? It isn't everybody who can be a writing machine like your hair professor. And <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, Mama, Uncle Vanya, I entreat. I hold my tongue. I hold my tongue. I apologize. <laughs> What a fine day. It's not too hot. It's a fine day to hang oneself. Nurse, darling, what did the peasants come about? Oh, the same thing, the wasteland again. Chug, 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 chug. Which is it you're calling? Speckley's gone off somewhere with her chickens. The crows might get them. Chug, 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 chug. Is the doctor here? Yes. If you please, Mihail Lvovich, they have sent for you. Where from? From the factory. Much obliged to you. Ah, I suppose I shall have to go. What a nuisance, thing. How annoying it is, really. Well, come back from the factory and have dinner. It'll be too late. How should I then? How could I then? <laughs> yeah, my good man, you might get me a glass of vodka anyway. How should I then? How could I then? In one of Ostrovsky's plays, there is a man with a big moustache and little wit, just like me. <laughs> well, I have the honor to take my leave. If ever you care to look in upon me, madame, with Sonia, I shall be only too delighted. I have a little estate, only 90 acres, but there's a model garden and nursery such as you wouldn't find for hundreds of miles around, if that interests you. Next to me is the government plantation. The forester there is old and nearly always ill, so that I really do all the work. <laughs> I've been told already that you're very fond of forestry. Of course, it may be of the greatest use, but doesn't it interfere with your real work? <laughs> you're a doctor. Only God knows what is one's real work. And is it interesting? Oh, yes, it is interesting work. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> you're still young. Well, you certainly don't look old. And I'm sure it cannot be as interesting as you say. Nothing but trees and trees. I should think it must be monotonous. Oh, no, it isn't. It's extremely interesting. Mihail Lvovich plants fresh trees every year. And already they've given him a bronze medal and a diploma. Ooh. He tries to prevent the old forests from being destroyed. And if only you'd listen to him, you'd agree with him entirely. He says that forests beautify the country. That they teach man to understand what is beautiful and develop a, a lofty attitude of mind. Forests temper the severity of the climate. <laughs> In countries where the climate is mild, less energy is wasted on the struggle with nature, and so man is softer and milder. And in such countries, people are beautiful, supple, and sensitive. Their language is elegant. Their movements are graceful. Art and learning flourish among them. Their philosophy is not gloomy, and their attitude to women is full of refined courtesy. <laughs> Bravo, bravo. <laughs> oh, that's all very charming, <laughs> but not convincing. Oh. So allow me, my friend, to go on heating my stoves with logs and building my barns of wood. <laughs> you can heat your stoves with peat and build your barns of brick. No, I, I'm not against you cutting down the wood as you need it, but why destroy whole forests? The Russian forests are going down under the axe. Millions of trees are perishing. The homes of Wild animals and birds are being laid waste. The rivers are dwindling and drying up. Wonderful scenery is disappearing, never to return. And all because lazy man has not the sense to stoop down and pick up the fuel off the ground. Am I not right, madam? Uh, one must be an unreflecting savage to burn this beauty in one's stove, to destroy what we cannot create. Man is endowed with reason and creative force to increase what has been given him, but so far he has not created but destroyed. There are fewer and fewer forests. The rivers are drying up. The wild creatures are becoming extinct. And the climate is ruined. And every day, the earth is growing poorer and more hideous. You needn't look at me like that. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> All I say seems to you to be utter nonsense, doesn't it? <laughs> well, perhaps I really am a Christ. <laughs> But, 
uh, when I walk by the peasants' woods, which I have saved from cutting down, or when I hear the rustling of the young cops planted by my own hands, I realize that the climate is to some extent in my power, and that if in a thousand years man is to be happy, I too shall have had some small hand in it. When I plant a young birch tree and see it growing green and swaying in the wind, my soul is filled with pride and... Uh, however, it's time for me to go. Probably the truth of the matter is that I am a crank. I have the honor to take my leave. When will you be coming to see us again? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Not for another month, I suppose. If anything happens, you let me know. You have been behaving impossibly again, Ivan Petrovich. Well, why need you have irritated Mama and talked about a writing machine? And today at lunch you quarreled with Alexandra again. Oh, how petty it all is. Yes, but if I hate him? There is no reason to hate Alexandra. <laughs> He's like everyone else. He's no worse than you are. If you could see your face, your move. You're too indolent to live. Oh, how indolent. <laughs> indolent. And bored. Everyone abuses my husband. Everyone looks at me with compassion, thinking, poor thing, she's got an old husband. This sympathy for me, I know what it means. As Astroff said just now, you all recklessly destroy the forest and soon there'll be nothing left on the earth. Well, in just the same way, you will recklessly destroy human beings. And soon, thanks to you, there will be no fidelity, no purity, no capacity for sacrifice left on earth. Why is it you can never look with indifference at a woman unless she is yours? Because that doctor is right. There is a devil of destruction in you all. You have no feeling for the woods or the birds or for women or for one another. I simply hate all this moralizing. That doctor has a weary, sensitive face. An interesting face. Sonia is evidently attracted by him. What? She's in love with him. And I understand her feelings. He has come three times since I've been here, but I'm shy and I've not once had a proper talk with him or been nice to him. He thinks I'm disagreeable. Most likely that is why you and I are such friends, Ivan Petrovich. We're both such tiresome, tedious people. Tiresome. Don't look at me like that. I don't like it. How else am I to look at you? Since I love you. You're my life, my happiness, my youth. Why, I know. The chances of your returning my love are nil, non-existent. But I want nothing. Just to look at you, listen to the sound of your voice. Hush, they may hear you. Don't, don't drive me away. Let me speak of my love. That alone will be the greatest happiness for me. This is agonizing.
<laughs> Who is it? Sonia? Is it you? It's me. You, Tenochtitl. Uh, uh, I'm in unbearable pain. Your rug has fallen on the floor. I'll close this window, Alexander. No, 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 I feel suffocated. I just dropped asleep. I dreamed my left leg did not belong to me. I was woken up by the agonizing pain. No, 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 it's not gout. It's more like rheumatism. What time is it now? It's 20 minutes past 12. Well, look for Batyushkov in the library in the morning. I believe we have his works. What? Look for Batyushkov in the morning. I remember we did have him. Well, why, why is it so difficult for me to breathe? You're tired. This is the second night you've not slept. Uh, I've been told Turgenev got angina pectoris from gout. I'm uh, afraid I may have it. Uh, I hate full detestable old age. Damnation, take it. Since I've grown old, I've grown to hate myself. You must all hate the sight of me. You speak of your age as though we were all responsible for it. I'm most of all hateful to you. Well, of course, you're right. I'm not a fool, and I understand. You are young and strong and good-looking. You want life. And I'm an old man, almost a corpse. You suppose I don't understand? <laughs> of course, it is stupid of me to go on living. But wait a little. I shall soon set you all free. I shan't have to ring around much longer. Oh, I'm worn out, for God's sake, because... Oh, it seems that thanks to me, everyone is worn out, depressed and wasting their youth. And I'm the only one enjoying life and satisfied. Oh, yes, of course. Please be quiet. You make me miserable. I make everyone miserable, of course. It is insufferable. Say what it is you want of me. Nothing. Well, be quiet, then. I employ. It's a strange thing. Ivan Petrovich may speak, and that old idiot Maria Vasilyev. No, there's nothing against it. Everyone listens. But if I say a word, everyone begins to feel depressed. They dislike the very sound of my voice. Well, suppose I am disagreeable, egoistic, and tyrannical. Haven't I a right, even in my old age, to think of myself? Haven't I earned it? Haven't I a right, I ask you, to be quiet in my old age, to be cared for by other people? No one is disputing your rights. The wind has got up. I'll close this window. There will be rain directly. No one disputes your rights. After devoting all one's life to study, after growing used to one's lecture room, one's room, one's society of honorable colleagues, all of a sudden to find oneself here in this spot, every day to see stupid people, to hear foolish conversation. Well, I want life. I like success. I like fame. I like distinction, renown. But here, it's like being in exile. Every moment to be grieving for the past watching the successes of others, dreading death. But I can't bear it. It's too much for me. And then they won't forgive me my age. Wait a little. Have patience. In five or six years, I shall be old, too. Father, you told us to send for Dr. Astroff yourself. Uh, now that he's come, you won't see him. It isn't nice. You've troubled him for nothing. Now, what good is your Astroff to me? He knows as much about medicine as I do about astronomy. Well, we can't send for all the great medical authorities here just for your gun. Well, I'm not going to talk to that crazy crank. Well, that's as you please. It doesn't matter to me. What's the time? Nearly one o'clock. But I feel stifled. Uh, Sonia, fetch me my drops from that table. Just a minute. Here you are. Oh, no, no, not those. It's no use asking for anything in this oh, house. Please don't be peevish. 
Some people may like it, but please spare me. I don't like it. Besides, I haven't the time. I have to be up early in the morning. We're haymaking tomorrow. There's a storm coming on. Ah, look. Helene, Sonia, you go to bed. I've come to take your place. No, 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 don't leave me alone with him. No, no, he'll be the death of me with his talking. No, but you must let them get some rest. This is the second night they've had no sleep. Well, let them go to bed, but you go too. Thank you. Now, I entreat you to go. For the sake of our past friendship, don't make any objections. We will talk some other time. Our past friendship, past. Oh, be quiet, Uncle. Oh, my love, don't leave me alone with him. He'll be the death of me with his talking. <laughs> this is really getting laughable. <laughs> Darling, you ought to be in bed. It's late. Well, the summer has not been clear. The camera will go to bed. Oh, everyone is kept up. Everyone is worn out. I'm the only one enjoying myself. Oh, yes, of course. Well, Master dear, is the pain so bad? I have a grumbling pain in my legs, too. Such a pain. Oh, you've had this trouble for years. Vera Petrovna Sonetska's mother. Used to be up night after night with you, wearing herself out. How fond she was of you. The old are like little children. They like someone to be sorry for them. But no one feels for the old. Come to bed, dear. Come, my honey. I'll give you some lime flower tea and warm your legs and say a prayer for you. Let us go, Marina. <laughs> I have such a grumbling pain in my legs myself. Such a pain. Vera Petrovna used to be crying and breaking her heart. You were only a might then, Sonetska, and you had no sense. Come on, come on. Oh, I'm quite worn out with him. I can hardly stand on my feet. You with him. I with myself. This is the third night that I've had no sleep. Oh, it's dreadful in this house. Your mother hates everything except her pamphlets and the professor. The professor is irritated. He doesn't trust me, and he's afraid of you. Sonia is angry with her father, angry with me, and hasn't spoken to me for a fortnight. You hate my husband and show open contempt for your mother. I am overwrought. I've been nearly crying 20 times today. <laughs> oh, it's dreadful in this house. Do let us drop this moralizing. You're an intelligent and a well-educated man, Ivan Petrovna. And I should have thought that you ought to realize that the world is not being destroyed through fire and robbery, but through hatred, enmity, and all this petty wrangling. <laughs> Now, it ought to be your work to reconcile everyone and not to grumble. Reconcile me to myself first, my precious, my splendid one. Don't. Go away. Storm will be over soon. And everything in nature will be refreshed and sigh with relief. The storm has brought no relief to me. Day and night, the thought that my life has been hopelessly wasted weighs on me like a nightmare. I have no past. It's been stupidly wasted in trifles. And the present is it's awful in its senselessness. Look, here you have my life and my love. What use can you make of them? Oh, what can I do with them? I, my passion is wasted like a ray of sunshine that's fallen into a well, and <laughs> I'm utterly lost, too. When you speak of your love for me, I feel stupid and don't know what to say. Forgive me. There is nothing I can say to you. Good night. If you only knew how wretched I am at the thought that here by my side, in this same house, another life is being wasted too. Yours. And what are you waiting for? What, what cursed theory holds you back? Oh, understand. Do, do understand. Ivan Petrovich, you are drunk. Well, I'm maybe, I'm maybe. Where is the doctor? He isn't there. He's staying the night. <laughs> It may be. Well, anything may be. Oh, you've been drinking again today. Now, why must you do that? Well, 
There's a semblance of life in it anyway. No, no, don't prevent me, Elaine. Well, you never used to drink. And you did not talk so much. Oh, go to bed, you bore me. Oh, my darling, my precious, my magnificent woman. No, this is really hateful. She's gone. Ten years ago, I used to meet her at my sister's. She was 17 then. I was 37. Now, why didn't I fall in love with her then and ask her to marry me? It could easily have happened then. And now she would have been my wife. And now we should have been awakened by the storm and she would have been frightened by the thunder and I, I, I would have held her in my arms and whispered, no, don't be frightened, I'm here. <laughs> oh, what marvelous thoughts, what happened. <laughs> it makes me laugh with delight. <laughs> Oh, my God, no, no, no. My thoughts are in the tangle. Why am I old? Why doesn't she understand me? Her, her fine phrases, her, her lazy morality, her nonsensical, lazy ideas about the ruin of the world. All that's absolutely hateful to me. My God, I've been cheated. And I adored that professor, that pitiful, gouty invalid. I worked for him like an ox. Sonia and I squeezed every farthing out of the estate. We, we haggled over linseed oil, curds, peas, like greedy peasants. We grudged ourselves every morsel to save up halfpence and farthings and give him thousands of rubles. Well, I was proud of him and of his learning. I, everything he said, everything he wrote, it seemed to me inspired by genius. My God, and now. Here he is retired, and now one can see the sum total of his life. He leaves not one page of real work behind him. He's, he's absolutely unknown. He's, he's nothing. He's a <laughs> soap bubble. I've been cheated. Well, I can see it now. So. Stupidly cheated. Play something. But what is he sleep? Play! <laughs> Are you alone? <laughs> no ladies here. Mm -hmm. Announce my heart and dance my soul. The master has no friend to love. <laughs> <laughs> Don't work me. Good rain. What time is it? Oh, goodness knows. I thought I had it in Andrea last night. Yeah, well, she was here a minute ago. Mm. Yeah, fine woman. <laughs> Medicines. What a lot of prescriptions. <laughs> from Kharkov, from Moscow, from Tula. He has bored every town with his gout. Tell me, is he really ill or shamming? No, he is ill. Uh, uh, why are we so melancholy today? Hmm? Are we sorry for the professor or what? Oh, leave me alone. Uh, or perhaps we are in love with the professor's lady. She is my friend. <laughs> already. What, what do you mean by already? Uh, uh, a uh, woman can become a man's friend only in the following sequence. First, agreeable acquaintance, then mistress, then friend. <laughs> what a vulgar theory, Mr. <laughs> well, uh, oh, yes, I must admit I'm growing vulgar. You see, I'm drunk, too. <laughs> As a rule, I get drunk like this once a month. And when I'm in this condition, I become coarse and insolent in the extreme. I don't stick at anything. I undertake the most difficult operations and perform them superbly. <laughs> I make the most extensive plans for the future. I don't regard myself as a crank at such times. No, no. I believe that I am being of immense service to humanity. <laughs> And 
I have my own philosophy of life at such times, and all of you, my good friends, <laughs> seem to me such <laughs> insects, <laughs> microbes. <laughs> what a play! I oh, yes, so I should be delighted to do anything for it. But you realize that everyone is asleep. Play! We will stop it. Come along. I fancy we have still some bracket left. And as soon as it is daylight, we'll all go over to my place, shall we? Oh, excuse me. I have no tie on. Uncle Vanya, you've been drinking again with the doctor. You are a nice pair. He has always been like that, but why must you do it? It's so unsuitable at your age. Age has got nothing to do with it. When a man has no real life, he has to live in illusions. But better than nothing, anyway. The hay is all cut. It rains every day. It's all rotting, and you are living in illusions. You've simply given up looking after anything. I have to do all the work alone, and I'm quite exhausted. Oh, Uncle. You have tears in your eyes. Tears? <laughs> Nonsense, not a bit of it. You looked at me just now so like your dear mother. <laughs> My sister. My dear sister, where is she now? If she knew, oh, oh, if she knew. If she knew what? Oh, it, it, it's painful, it's useless. Well, afterwards, nothing. Uh, no, no. I'm going to bed. Mihailovich, you are not asleep, are you? No. One moment, please. I'm just going. What can I do for you? Drink yourself if it does not disgust you. But I implore you, don't let my uncle drink. It's bad for you. We won't drink anymore. I'm just going anyway. What? No, it'll be daylight by the time they put the horses in. But it's raining. No. Wait till the morning. Oh, no. We shall only come in for the end of it. Now, I'm going, and please don't send for me again to see your father. I tell him it's gout, and he tells me it's rheumatism. I ask him to stay in bed, and he sits in a chair, and today he wouldn't speak to me at all. I'm afraid he's spoiled. Look, wouldn't you like something to eat? Perhaps. <laughs> I like eating at night. I believe there is something left here. They say he's been a great favourite with the ladies oh, and yes. women I have sports. Yes, Look, well, there you are. Have some cheese. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> you know, I, I've had nothing to eat all day. Only drink. <laughs> Your father has a difficult temper, hasn't he? <laughs> May I? Uh, You know, there's no one about, and one may speak frankly. No, I, I don't believe I could live in your house for a month. No, I, sh I should be choked by the atmosphere. Your father, who's entirely absorbed in his gout and his books. Uncle Vanya with his melancholy. Your grandmother. And your stepmother, too. What about my stepmother? Well, everything ought to be beautiful in a human being. Face, dress, soul, and ideas. Now, she is beautiful. There's no denying that. But, you know, she does nothing all day long but eat, sleep, walk about, fascinate us all by her beauty. Nothing more. She has no duties. Other people work for her. That's true, isn't it? 
and an idle life cannot be pure. <laughs> Perhaps I'm being too severe. I'm dissatisfied with life like your Uncle Vanya, and we're both growing peevish. You are dissatisfied with life? Oh, I love life as such. But our life, our everyday provincial life in Russia, I can't endure. I despise it with every fiber of my being. And as for my own personal life, there's absolutely nothing nice about that, I can assure you. Now, you know, when, um, when you walk through a forest on a dark night and a light gleams in the distance, you don't notice the darkness, nor your weariness, nor the sharp twigs that lash you in the face. Now, I work, as you know, harder than anyone in the district. Now, fate is continually lashing at me. At times, I'm unbearably miserable. And I have no light in the distance. I expect nothing for myself. I'm not fond of my fellow creatures. It's years since I cared for anyone. Do you care for no one at all? I have a certain affection for your old nurse for the sake of old times. But the peasants are too much alike, undeveloped, living in dirt. It's difficult to get on with the educated people. They're all wearisome. Our good friends, for instance, are small in their ideas, small in their feelings, and, and don't see beyond their noses, or to put it bluntly, they're stupid. And those who are bigger and more intelligent are hysterical morbidly absorbed in introspection and analysis. They're forever whining. They're insanely given to hatred and slander. They'll steal up to a man sideways, look at him askance and decide, ah, he is a neurotic. Or oh, he's posing. <laughs> when they don't know what label to stick on my forehead, they say, he's an odd fellow, very odd. I'm fond of forestry, that's odd. I don't eat meat, that's odd too. There's no direct genuine, free attitude to people, or to nature left amongst them. No. No. Oh, no, please, I beg you, don't drink anymore. Why not? Because it's so out of keeping with you. You're so refined. You have such a beautiful voice. You. Oh, more than that, you're unlike everyone else I know. You are beautiful. Why then do you want to be like ordinary people who drink and play cards? Oh, don't do it, I beseech you. You always say that people don't create but only destroy what heaven gives them. And why do you destroy yourself? Why? Oh, you mustn't. You mustn't, I beseech you, I implore you. I won't drink anymore. Give me your word. My word of honor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Enough. I've come to my senses. <laughs> there, you see, I, uh, I'm quite sober now, and I shall be so till the end of my days. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, as I was saying, uh, my day is over. It's too late for me. I've grown old. I have worked too hard. I've grown vulgar. All my feelings are blunted. And I believe I'm not capable of being fond of anyone. I don't love anyone. I don't believe I ever shall. What still affects me is beauty. That does stir me. I fancy if Elena Andreevna, for example, wanted you, she could turn my head in one day. But uh, uh, that's not love. That's not uh, affection. Oh. What is it? Hmm? Nothing. Uh, in Lent, one of my patients died under chloroform, you know. Oh, you must try and forget that now. Hmm. Tell me. 
name Mihailovich. If I had a friend or a younger sister, and if you found out that she... Well, suppose she loved you. How would you take that? I don't know. No, how I expect I, I should give her to understand that I could not care for her, that my mind was taken up with other things. Anyway, if I'm going, I really must get off. Goodbye, my dear girl. We shall not finish till morning. I'll, I'll go out through this way, if you don't mind. I don't want your uncle to detain me. You know. No, no, please. Thank you. He said nothing to me. His heart and his soul are still shut away from me. But why do I feel so happy? I said to him, you are refined, noble. You have such a beautiful voice. You are... Oh, was it inappropriate? His voice trembles and caresses one. I can still feel it vibrating in the air. And when I spoke to him of a younger sister, and he did not understand. Oh, how awful it is that I am not beautiful. How awful it is. And I know I'm not. I know it, I know it. Last Sunday, as people were coming out of church, I heard them talking about me. And one woman said, she's a sweet and generous nature. What a pity she's so plain. Plain. Oh, the storm is over. Oh, what a mess of air. Where is the doctor? He's gone. Sophie. What is it? How long are you going to be sulky with me? We've done each other no harm. Oh, why should we be enemies? Let us make it up. Oh, yes. I want it to myself. Don't let's be cross anymore. <laughs> Has father gone to bed? No. No, he's sitting in the drawing room. <laughs> oh, we don't speak to each other for weeks. And goodness knows why. Oh, what's this? Oh, the doctor has been having some supper. Oh, and there's wine, too. Let us drink to our friendship. All right. Out of the same glass, shall we? Yes. <laughs> So now we're friends. Friends? <laughs> oh, I have been wanting to make it up for ever so long. <laughs> Only somehow I felt ashamed. Oh, why are you crying? Oh, it's nothing. I'm sorry. Oh, come now. <laughs> there. There, there. Oh, I'm a quick creature. I'm crying. <laughs> You're angry with me because you think I married your father for the wrong reason. Oh, no, if it will make that... you believe me, I will swear it. I married him for love. I was attracted by him as a learned, celebrated man. It wasn't real love. It was all made up, but I fancied at the time it was real. It's not my fault. And ever since our marriage, you have been punishing me with those clever, suspicious oh, eyes. Oh, no, no more. Please, let us forget. Yes, but you mustn't look like that. It doesn't suit you. You must believe in everyone. There's no living if you don't. Tell me, honestly, as a friend, are you happy? No. I knew that. One more question. Tell me frankly. 
Wouldn't you have liked your husband to be young? <laughs> oh, what a child you are. Still. Well, of course I should. Oh, well, ask some more questions. <laughs> ask away. <laughs> Do you like the doctor? <laughs> yes. Yes, very much. I, oh dear, do I look silly? <laughs> He's gone away, but I can still hear his voice and his footsteps. <laughs> and when I look at the dark window, I can see his face. Oh, do let me tell you, though. I can't speak so loud, but I feel ashamed. <laughs> Come, come with me into my room. We can talk there. Come. Oh, you do think I'm silly. I know you do. Oh, tell me something about it. Oh, what do you want me to tell you? Well, he's so clever. He understands everything. He can do anything. He doctors people and plants forests, too. <laughs> Oh, my dear, it's not a question of forest or medicine. No, no, you must understand. He has a spark of genius. And you know what that means. Boldness, freedom of mind, wits of outlook. He plants a tree, and already he is seeing what will follow from it in a thousand years. He already has visions of the happiness of humanity. <laughs> oh, such people are rare. One must love them. Oh, he drinks. Sometimes he's a little coarse, but what does that matter? A talented man cannot keep spotless in Russia. Well, oh, only think what sort of a life that doctor has. Impassable mud on the roads, frost, snowstorms, the immense distances, the coarse, savage peasants, poverty and disease all around him. It is hard for one who is working and struggling day after day in such surroundings to keep sober and spotless till he's 40. Oh, oh but uh, I wish you happiness with all my heart. Mm, you deserve it. I'm a tiresome secondary character. In music, in my husband's house, in love. Oh, everywhere, in fact. I've always played a secondary part. As a matter of fact, if you come to think of it, Sonia, I'm very, very unhappy. There is no happiness in this world for me. None. <laughs> Why do you love? Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Oh, oh I have a longing for music. I, I should like to play something. Oh, yes. Yes, you play something. I can't sleep. You play something. Oh. Your father's not asleep. Music irritates him when he's ill. I'll go and ask him. If he doesn't object, I'll play. Yes, very well. <laughs> oh, it's a long time since I've played the piano. I shall play and cry. Cry like an idiot. Is that you tapping, Yasin? Yes. Don't tap. The master is unwell. That's going. Come, boy. Good lad. We mustn't. The Herr Professor has graciously expressed the desire that we should all gather in this room today at one o'clock. It's now a quarter to. He has some communication to make to the world. Probably some business man. <laughs> he has no business. He spends his time writing twaddle, grumbling, and being jealous. Uncle Vanya. Oh, I, I apologize. I hold my tongue. <laughs> Just look at her. She's so lazy, she almost staggers as she walks. No, no, it's charming, very. You keep buzzing and buzzing away all day. Aren't you tired of it? I'm bored to death. I don't know what I'm to do. Well, isn't there plenty to do, if only you cared to do it? For instance? You could help us run the estate. 
Teach the children. Look after the sick. There's plenty to do. When you and father went here, Uncle Vanya and I used to go to the market ourselves and sell the flour. But I don't know how to do such things. And besides, they're not interesting. It's only in sociological novels that people teach the peasants or doctors. And... <laughs> well, how am I, apropos of nothing, to go and teach them or doctor them? I don't see how one can help doing it. You wait a little and you two will soon get into the way of it. Oh, don't be so depressed, dear. You are bored and don't know what to do with yourself. And boredom and idleness are catching. <laughs> Look at Uncle Vanya. He does nothing but follow you about like a shadow. I have left my work and run away to talk to you. I've grown lazy. I can't help it. The doctor used to come and see us very rarely. Once a month. It was difficult to persuade him to come. Now he drives over every day. He neglects his forestry and his patients, too. You must be a witch. Why be miserable? Oh, come, my precious, my splendid one, be sensible. You have mermaid blood in your veins. Oh, be a mermaid. Let yourself go for once in your life. Make haste and fall head over ears in love with some water sprite and then plunge headlong into the abyss so that the Herr Professor and all of us may throw up our hands in amazement. Oh, will you leave me in peace? How cruel it all Oh, no, no. My dearest, please, forgive me. I apologize. Peace. Oh, you would drive an angel out of patience, you know. As a sign of peace and harmony, I will fetch you a bunch of roses. I gathered them for you this morning. Autumn roses. Exquisite, mournful roses. Autumn roses. Exquisite, mournful roses. It's September already. However are we to get through the winter here? Yeah. Where's the doctor? He's in Uncle Vanya's room, writing something. I'm glad Uncle Vanya's gone. I want to talk to you. What about? Oh, what about? <laughs> oh, come now. There. I am not good-looking. You have beautiful eyes. Oh, no, no. When a woman is plain, she's always told, you have beautiful hair, you have beautiful eyes. I have loved him for six years. I love him more than my own mother. Every moment, I'm conscious of him. I feel the touch of his hand, and I watch the door. I wait, expecting him every moment to come in. And here, you see, I keep coming to you simply to talk of him. Now he's here every day. But he doesn't look at me. He doesn't see me. And that is such agony. I have no hope at all. None. None. Oh, my God, give me strength. I've been praying all night. I often go up to him, begin talking to him, look into his eyes. I have no pride left, no strength to control myself. I couldn't keep it back yesterday, and I told Uncle Vanya that I love him. All the servants know I love him. Everybody knows. And he? No. He doesn't notice Strange man. Do you know what? Let me speak to him. I'll do it carefully. Just hint at it. Oh, yes, really. How much longer are you to remain in uncertainty? Let me. It won't be difficult to find out whether he loves you or not. Oh, don't be troubled, my darling. Don't be uneasy. I shall do it so carefully that he won't even notice it. All we want to do is to find out, yes or no. If it's no, he'd better not come here. How do we... It's easier to bear when one doesn't see the man. Now, now we won't put things off. We'll question him straight away. He was meaning to show me some charts. 
Go and tell him that I want to see him. You, you will tell me the whole truth? Oh, yes, of course. It seems to me that the truth, however dreadful it is, is not so dreadful as uncertainty. Oh, don't lie on me, dear. Yes, very well. I'll tell him you want to see his job. Oh, no. Uncertainty is better. One has hope, at least. What do you say? Oh, nothing. Oh, nothing. Nothing is worse than knowing someone else's secret and not being able to help. He's not in love with her, that's evident, but why should he not marry her? She's not good looking, but she'd make a capital wife for a country doctor at his age. She's so kind and sensible and, and pure hearted. Oh, no. No, not that. I understand the poor child. In the midst of desperate boredom, with nothing but grey shadows wandering about instead of human beings, with only dull commonplaces to listen to, among people who can do nothing but eat and drink and sleep. He sometimes appears on the scene, unlike the rest, handsome, interesting, fascinating, like a like a bright moon rising in the darkness. Oh, to yield to the charm of such a man, to forget oneself. I believe I'm a little fascinated myself. Yes, yes, I feel bored when he doesn't come. And already I'm smiling when I think of him. That Uncle Vanya says I I have mermaid's blood in my veins. Let yourself go for once in your life. Well, maybe that's what I ought to do. Oh, if only I could fly free as a bird away from all of you, from your sleepy faces, from your talk, forget your existence. But I'm cowardly and different. My conscience troubles me. He comes here every day, and I know why he comes. And already I have a guilty feeling. Oh, I'm ready to throw myself on my knees before Sonia, to beg her pardon and to cry. Good afternoon. You wanted to see my handiwork? You promised yesterday to show me. Can you spare the time? <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> Where were you born? In Petersburg. Ah. Where did you study? At the School of Music. Uh, I don't suppose this will be interesting to you. Why not? It's true that I don't know the country, but I have read a great deal. At my own table here in this house, in Vanya's room, I'm so exhausted that I feel completely stupefied. I throw up everything, fly here, and amuse myself with this for an hour or two. Vanya and Sonia click their counting beads, and I sit near them at my table and daub away. And I feel snug and comfortable. And uh, the cricket chirs, of course. <laughs> but I don't allow myself that indulgence too often. Only once a month. <clears throat> now, this is a, a picture of our district as it was uh, 50 years ago. The dark and the light green stands for forest. Half of the whole area was covered with forest. Where there is a network of red over the green, elks and wild goats were common. I show both the flora and the fauna. Uh, on this lake, there were swans, geese, and ducks. And the old people tell us there was a power of birds of all sorts. No end of them. They flew in clouds. And besides the villages and hamlets, you see scattered here and there all sorts of old settlements, little farms, monasteries of old believers, water mills. Horned cattle and horses were numerous. That's shown by the blue color, for instance. The blue color lies thick on this neighborhood. Here there were regular droves of horses and every homestead had three on an average. Let us uh, turn to the second part. This is how it was uh, 25 years ago. Already you see only a third of the area is under forest. There are no wild goats left, but there are elks. Both the blue and the green are paler and so on and so on. Now let us turn to the third part. A map of the district as it is at present. 
It is green here and there, but only in patches. All the elks have vanished, and so have the swans and the capercailsies too. Over the old settlements and farms and monasteries, water mills, there is not a trace. In fact, it's a picture of gradual and unmistakable degeneration, which will apparently in another 10 or 15 years be complete. You will tell me that it is the influence of civilization. The old life must naturally give way to the new. Yes, I understand that. If there were high roads and railways on the site of these ruined forests, if there were works and factories and schools, the peasants would be better off, healthier, more intelligent. But you see, there is nothing of the sort. We have still the same swamps and mosquitoes, still the same lack of roads and poverty, typhus and diphtheria, and fires in the district. We have here a degeneration that is the result of too severe a struggle for existence. This is due to inertia, to ignorance, to the complete lack of understanding. When a man, cold, hungry, and sick, simply to save what is left of life, to keep his children alive, instinctively, unconsciously, clutches at anything to satisfy his hunger, warm himself, destroys everything heedless of the morrow. Almost everything has been destroyed already, but, but uh, nothing has as yet been created to take its place. Yes, I see from your face that it doesn't interest you. Oh, it's just that I understand so little about all this. Well, there's nothing to understand in it. It simply doesn't interest you. To speak frankly, I'm thinking of something else. Oh, forgive me. I want to put you through a little examination, and I'm troubled and don't know how to begin. Yes, but not a very formidable one. Let us sit down. It concerns a certain young lady. Let us talk like honest people, like friends, without beating about the bush. Let us talk and forget all about it afterwards. Yes? Yes. It concerns my stepdaughter, Sonia. You like her, don't you? Oh, yes, I like her very much. Does she attract you as a woman? No. A few words more and I have done. Have you noticed nothing? <laughs> nothing. You do not love her. I see it from your eyes. She, she's unhappy. Understand that and... And don't come here anymore. Oh. My day is over. What time have I for such things? Besides, I have too much to do. What an unpleasant conversation. I'm trembling as though I've been carrying a ton of weight. Well, thank God that's over. Let us forget it. Let it be as though we have not spoken at all and and go away. Well, you're an intelligent man, you'll understand. Oh, I feel heart worn over. If you had spoken a month or two ago, I might perhaps have considered it. But now. And if she's unhappy, then of course. There's only one thing I can't understand. What made you ask me? <laughs> You're a sly one. Huh? What does that mean? Sly. <laughs> Suppose Sonia is unhappy, and I'm quite ready to admit it. Why need you go into it? No, oh, please, don't try to look astonished. You know perfectly well what brings me here every day. Why, and on whose account I am here, you know perfectly well. You charming bird of prey, don't look at me like that. I'm an old sparrow. A bird of prey? I don't understand. <laughs> a beautiful, fluffy weasel. You must have a victim. Here have I been doing nothing for a whole month. I've thrown up everything. I seek you greedily. And you're awfully pleased with it. Awfully. Well, I'm conquered. You knew that before your examination. I submit. Come and devour me. Oh, but you're mad. You, oh, if it but, but I'm not as bad and as mean as you think I'm going away today. I won't come here again, but... Where shall we see each other? Someone may come in. Tell me where. Some quickly, tell me where. How wonderful, how magnificent you are. One kiss. If I could only kiss your fragrant hair. I assure you. Why, assure me, there's no need. 
No need of unnecessary words. Oh, how beautiful you are. What hand? Oh, no, 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 that's well, enough. Speak, speak. Where shall we meet tomorrow, you see? It's inevitable. We must meet. Please, no, no. let me go. <laughs> oh, no. Come to the plantation tomorrow. Two o'clock. Yes? You'll come. Let me go. This is awful. Uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. Uh, oh, no. Never mind. The weather is not so bad today, Arnit Ivan Petrovich. In the morning, it was overcast, as though we were going to have rain. Now, it's sunny. To tell the truth, the autumn has turned out magnificently. And uh, the winter corn is quite promising. The only thing is, the days are getting shorter. It will try. You will do your utmost that my husband and I should leave here today. Do you hear me this very day? What? Oh, uh, yes, of course. I saw it all, Elaine, all. Do you hear me? I must get away from here today. Yes. I don't feel quite the thing myself, Your Excellency. I've been poorly the last two days. My head is rather queer. Now, where are the others? No, I don't like this house. It's a perfect labyrinth. Twenty-six huge rooms. People wander in different directions. There's no finding anyone. Uh, ask Maria Vasilyevna and Ilyena Andreevna to come here. I am here. Uh, sit down, friends, I beg. What did you say? Oh, presently. Oh, no, tell me, please. You're trembling. I understand. He won't be coming here anymore, yes? Oh, tell me, yes. <laughs> One can put up with illness after all, but what I can't endure is the whole manner of living in the country. I feel as though I'd been cast off the earth into some other planet. <laughs> and my friends, I beg you to sit down. Uh, Sonia. It's Sonia. Does not hear you sit down too, nurse. I beg you, my friends, hang your ears on the nail of attention, as the saying is. <laughs> um, but, uh, perhaps I'm not wanted. May I go? Oh, no, 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 no. It is who you whom we need most. Oh, what do you require of me? Require of you now? Why are you cross? Or if I've been to blame in any way, pray excuse me. No, 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 let's be silly. Let's come to business. What, what, what is it you want? Ah, uh, here is Mama. I will begin, friends. I have invited you, gentlemen to announce that the Inspector General is coming. <laughs> but uh, let us lay aside jesting. It is a serious matter. I have called you together, my friends, uh, to ask for your advice and help. And knowing your invariable kindness, I hope to receive it. Now, I am a studious, bookish man and have never had anything to do with practical life. I cannot dispense with the assistance of those who understand it. And I beg you, Ivan Petrovich, and you, Ilya Ilyich, oh, and you, Mama. The point is that manadomnes una nox. That is, that we are all mortal. I am old and ill, so I think it is high time to settle my worldly affairs so far as they concern my family, my life is over. Oh, I'm not thinking of myself. But I have a young wife and an unmarried daughter. It is impossible for me to go on living in the country. We are not made for country life. But to live in town on the income we derive from this estate is equally impossible. If we sell the forest, for instance, that's an exceptional measure which we cannot repeat every year. We must take some steps that would guarantee us a permanent and a more or less definite income. I have thought of such a measure and have the honor of submitting it to your consideration. Now, omitting details, I will put it before you in rough outline. Our estate yields on an average not more than 2% of its capital value. I propose to sell it. If we invest the money in some suitable securities, we should get from 4 to 5%. And I think we might even have a few thousand rubles to spare for buying a small villa in Finland. Just, just a minute. Uh, 
Surely my ears are deceiving me. Repeat what you have said. That you put the money in some suitable investment and with the remainder purchase a villa in Finland. Uh, that's it. You'll sell the estate. Well, that's superb. That's a grand idea. And what do you propose to do with me and your old mama and Sonia here? Oh, we settle all that in due time. One can't think of everything at once. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Obviously, said, up to now, I haven't had a grain of common sense. Up to now, I always thought that the estate belongs to Sonia. My father bought this estate as a dowry for my sister. Well, up till now, I've been simple. I, I didn't interpret the law like a Turk, but I always imagined that my sister's estate passed to my sister's daughter. Well, certainly the estate belongs to Sonia, who disputes it. Well, Without Sonia's consent, I shall not venture to sell it. Besides, I am proposing to do it for Sonia's benefit. It's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. I mean, I... I, I, I don't you... Do not contradict Alexandre. Believe me, he knows better than we do what is for the best. Now, I'll give me some water. Oh, go on, say what you like, say what you like. But I don't understand why you're so upset. I don't say my plan is ideal. If everyone thinks it unsuitable, I will not insist on it. Uh, of course, I care deeply for learning, Your Excellency. It's not simply a feeling of reverence, it's a sort of family feeling. You see, my brother, Grigory Ilyich, his wife's brother, Konstantin Trofimich Rakidemenov. Uh, perhaps you know... Uh, no. Uh, well, he's a master of art. Waffles, so, uh, stop. Like, uh, uh, We're talking uh, about uh, business. Just, just uh, wait uh, a little, uh, will uh, you, uh, later. Uh, Here, look! Uh, ask Waffles. The estate was bought from his Don't uncle. Why should I ask him what for? The estate was bought for 95,000 rubles. My father paid only 75,000 and, and 20,000 remained on mortgage. Now, now listen! The estate would never have been bought in the first place if I had not renounced my share of the inheritance in favor of my sister, who, 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 whom I dearly loved. What's more, I worked for 10 years like a slave and paid off all the mortgage. I regret that I broached the... No, the estate is free from debt and in good condition, only owing to my personal efforts. And now that I'm old, I'm to be kicked out of it. I don't understand what you're aiming at. Look, I've been managing this estate. For 25 years, sending you money like a most conscientious steward. And you've never once thanked me in all those years. All that time, both when I was young and now, you give me 500 rubles a year as salary, a beggarly wage, and it never even occurred to you to add one ruble to it. But Ivan Petrovich, how could I tell? I'm not a practical man. I don't understand these things. You could have added as much to it as you chose. Why didn't I steal? Why don't you all despise me because I didn't steal? It would have been right, and I wouldn't have been a pauper now. No, my dear soul, don't, don't. I'm all of a tremble. Why spoil our good relations? You mustn't. For 25 years, I've lived within these four walls, buried like a mole with, with Mama. All our thoughts and feelings were for you alone. By day, we talked of you and of your works. When we mentioned your name, it was with reverence. We wasted our nights reading books and magazines, for which now I have the deepest contempt. No, 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 Thanks to you, I've ruined and wasted the best years of my life of my bitterest enemy. No! no! I don't know what it is you want from me. And what right have you to speak to me like this? You, you lament to take. If the estate is yours, take it. I don't want it. I'm going away from the hell. It's very I got I had talent. I had courage. I had intelligence. If I had had a normal life, I, I might have been a, a Schopenhauer or Dostoevsky. Oh, no, I'm talking like an idiot and going out of my mind. But I'm a dis <laughs> Do as that example tells you. No, Mother, what am I to do? No, yes, no. don't say anything. I know what I must do. You shall remember me. Take that madman away. I cannot live under the same roof with him. Yeah, He's always there, almost beside me. Well, let him move into the village or into the lodge, Alexander. or I will move. But live in the same house with him, I cannot do. Oh, we will leave this place today. We will pack up this very minute. Father, you must be merciful. Uncle Vanya and I are so unhappy. Oh, 
father remember how when you were younger, Uncle Vanya and Grandmama sat up all night copying your books, all night. Uncle Vanya and I have worked without resting. We were afraid to spend a farthing on ourselves. We sent it all to you. We did not eat the bread of idleness. Oh, I'm saying it all wrong, Father, but you ought to understand him. Father, you must be merciful. Make it up with him, for God's sake. I beseech you, Alexander. Oh, very well. I talk to him. I'm not accusing him of anything. I'm not angry with him. But you must admit his behavior is strange. Oh, no. Never mind, oh, no. child. The ganders will cackle a bit and oh, leave no. off. They will cackle and leave off. Well, you're trembling as though you were frozen there, there, little orphan. God is merciful. A cup of lime flower water, a raspberry tea, and it will pass. Don't grieve, little orphan. Ah, oh, what a to do they make the ganders plague take them. Oh, bother, and take them. Hold him, hold him, he's out of it. Come on out, please. Oh, let me go. Where is he? Ah, oh, there he is. I missed! I missed the gem! Oh, damn this and damn this and take it! What am I doing? What am I doing? You must make haste, Marina. They'll soon be calling us to say goodbye. They've already ordered the horses. No, there's not much left. They're going to Harkov. They will live there. Much better so. <laughs> They've had a fright. Yelena Andreevna keeps on saying, I won't stay another hour. Let us get away. Let us get away. We will stay at Harkov, she says. We will have a look round, and then we'll send for our things. They're not taking much with them. It seems it is not ordained that they should live here, mm. Marina. It is not ordained. It is a dispensation of providence. Mm. It's better so. Look at all that quarreling and shooting this morning. What a storm. A subject worthy of the brush of Ayavadovsky. Mm. Shocking sight it was. We shall live again in the old way now as we used to. We shall have breakfast at eight and dinner at one and sit down to supper in the evening. Everything as it should be, like other people, like Christians. Oh, it's a long while since I've tasted noodles, sinner that I am. Yes, it's a long time since they've given us noodles at dinner. A very long time. <laughs> when I was walking through the village this morning, Marina, the man in the shop called after me, you Kadja, living upon other people. <laughs> It did hurt me so. Oh, you shouldn't take any notice of that, my dear. We all live upon God. Whether it's you or Sonia or Ivan Petrovich, none of you sits idle. We all work hard, all of us. Where's Sonia? In the garden. She's still going round with the doctor looking for Ivan Petrovich. They're afraid he may lay hands upon himself. And where's his pistol? <laughs> I hid it in the cellar. <laughs> what goings on? Oh, go away. You leave me alone if only for an hour. I won't endure being watched. Certainly, Sonia. The gander says, what? 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 <laughs> leave me alone. Oh, I should be delighted to. I ought to have gone long ago, but I repeat, I won't go until you give me back what you took from me. I didn't take anything from you. I'm speaking in earnest. Now, don't detain me. I should have gone long ago. I took nothing from you. I'll wait a little while longer and then excuse me, but we must resort to force. We shall have to tie your hands behind you and search you. I am speaking quite seriously. Oh, that's as you please. <laughs> to have made such a fool of myself. To have fired at him twice and missed him. I'll never forgive myself for that. If you had to be playing about with firearms, you'd have done better to take a pop at yourself. Do you know, it, it's queer. I've attempted to commit a murder and have not been arrested. Nobody's even sent for the police. <laughs> So, of course, I'm, I'm looked upon as a madman. Well, I'm mad, but... People are not mad who hide their crass stupidity and their flagrant heartlessness under the guise of an old professor. People are not mad who marry old men and then deceive them under everybody's nose. 
I saw you kissing her, I saw. Yes, I did kiss her, and that's more than you ever have, isn't it? The world is mad to let you go on living Don't on it. Come, that's silly. Yes, well, I'm mad. I'm not responsible. I'm allowed to say silly things. Oh, eh? Don't be childish. You're, you're not a madman. You're just a crank. A buffoon. Once I used to look upon every crank as an invalid, as abnormal. But now I think it is the normal condition of man to be a crank. You are quite normal. I'm so ashamed. If you only knew how ashamed I am, I... No pain can be compared with this acute shame. It's, it's, it's unbearable. Look, what am I to do? What am I to do? Nothing. Well, give me something. Oh, my God. Look, I'm 47. If I live till I'm 60, I, I'll have another 13 years. That's, that's a long time. How, how am I to get through those 13 years? Oh, you know, you know. If only one could live the rest of one's life in some new way. To wake up one still, sunny morning and find that one had begun a new life, that all the past had been forgotten and melted away like smoke. To begin a new life. Tell me how to begin it, what to begin it for. Oh, with. get away with you. New life, indeed. Our situation, yours and mine, is hopeless. Yes? Well, of course it is. Well, give me something. I've got a scalding pain here. Stop it! Those who will live after us in a hundred or two hundred years and will despise us for having lived our lives so stupidly and tastelessly, they may perhaps find a means of being happy. But we, there's only one hope for you and me. The hope that when we are asleep in our graves, we may perhaps be visited by visions. Perhaps even pleasant one. Yes, old man, in the whole district there were only two decent, well-educated men. You and I. And in some ten years, the common round of the trivial life here has swamped us and poisoned our lives with its vapidity and made us just as despicable as all the rest. Yes, but don't you try to put me off. You give me back what you took from me. I didn't take anything You from took me. a bottle of morphia out of my medicine chest. Now, look here. If you insist on making an end of yourself, then go into the forest and shoot yourself. Go on, but give me back the morphia or there will be talk and conjecture. Now, people will think I've given it to you. It'll be quite enough for me to have to make your post-mortem. Do you think I shall find that interesting? Now, leave me alone. Sophia Alexander. Now, your uncle has taken a bottle of morphia out of my medicine chest and won't give it back. Tell him that it's... Really stupid, and I haven't the time to waste. I ought to be going. Uncle Vanya, did you take the morphine? Oh, yes, he did. I'm quite sure. Give it back. Oh, why do you frighten us? Give it back, Uncle Vanya. I am perhaps just as unhappy as you are, but I'm not going to give way to despair. I am bearing it and will bear it until my life ends of itself. You must be patient, too. Give it back, Uncle. Oh, dear good uncle, darling, you are kind. You will have pity on us and give it back. Oh, be patient, uncle. Be patient. There you are. Take it. Uh, I must make haste and do something. Uh, make haste and work or else I can't. Yes, we will. As soon as we've seen our people off, we'll sit down to work. We have let everything go. Now I can set off. Ivan Petrovich, are you here? I... Go to Alexander. He wants to say something to you. Oh, yes, go, Uncle Vanya. Please. Oh, come, let us go. Father and you must be reconciled. That's essential. I'm going away. Goodbye. Already? The carriage is waiting. Goodbye. You promised me today that you would go away. I remember. I'm just going. You have taken fright? Is it so terrible? Yes. You better stay after all. What do you say? Tomorrow in the plantation. No, it's settled. And I can look at you so fearlessly just because it is settled. I have only one favor to ask of you. Think better of me. 
Oh, I should like you to have a respect. Oh, do stay. I ask you to. Do recognize you've nothing to do in this world. You have no object in life. You've nothing to occupy your mind. And that sooner or later you will give way to feeling. Now it is inevitable. And it had better not be in Kharkov or somewhere in Kursk, but here in the lap of nature. It's poetical anyway. Even the autumn is beautiful. We have the forest plantation here. Half-ruined homesteads in the Turgenev style. <laughs> How absurd you are. I am angry with you, and yet I shall think of you with pleasure. You're an interesting, original man. We shall never meet again, so why conceal it? I was a little bit in love with you. Come. Let us shake hands and part friends. Don't remember evil against me. Yes, you'd better go. You seem to be a good, warm-hearted creature. Yet there's something strange about the whole aura of you. <laughs> you came here with your husband and all of us who were at work here, toiling away and creating something. Had to fling aside our work and attend to nothing all the summer but your husband's gout and you. <laughs> Oh, the two of you have infected all of us with your idleness. I was attracted by you and have done nothing for a month. Meanwhile, people have been ill, and peasants have pastured their cattle in my young woods of half-grown trees. And so you see, wherever you and your husband go, you bring destruction everywhere. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. <laughs> Yet it is strange. And I'm quite sure that if you'd stayed here, the devastation would have been immense. I should have been done for. You wouldn't have fared too well either. Well, go away. Finita la commedia. Hmm? I shall take this pencil as a keepsake. Strange. We have been friends. And all at once, for some reason, we shall never meet again. So it is with everything in this world. While there is no one here, before Uncle Vanya comes in with a nosegay, allow me to kiss you at parting. Yes? Yeah. That's right. I, I wish you all happiness. Well, so be it. For once in my life. I must go. I must go. Yes, you'd better go. Since the carriage is here, you'd better set off. There's someone coming, I believe. Let be my guns be my guns. After what has happened, I've been through and endured so much these last few hours. I believe I could write a whole treatise on the art of living for the benefit of posterity. I gladly accept your apologies and apologize myself. Goodbye. You shall receive regularly the same sum as hitherto. Everything shall be as before. Uh, Mama. Alexandre, have your photograph taken again and sent it to me. You know how dear you are to me. <laughs> Goodbye, Your Excellency. Don't forget <laughs> Goodbye, us. everyone. Ah, Sonia. Goodbye, Goodbye. Father. Oh, <laughs> thanks for your pleasant company. You know, I respect your way of thinking, your enthusiasms, your impulses. <laughs> but permit an old man to add one observation to his farewell message. You must work, my friends. You must work. I wish you all things good. <laughs> Goodbye. Forgive me. We shall never meet again. Goodbye, dear Ivan Petrovich. Waffles, you might tell them by the way to bring my horses round too, will you? Certainly, my dear George. Why don't you go and see them all? I can't. My heart is too heavy. No, let them go. 
I must hurry up and do something. Ah, work. Professor's glad I've been found. Nothing will tempt him back. Oh, they've gone. They've gone. Good luck to them. Now, Uncle Vanya, let us do something. Yeah, work, work, eh? It's a long time since we sat at this table together. Oh, I believe there's no ink. I feel sad that they've gone. They have gone. Now, first of all, Uncle Vanya, let us do the accounts. We've neglected it all dreadfully. Someone sent for his account again today. If you will look after those, I'll see to these. Delivered to Mr... Uh... I'm ready for bye-bye. How quiet it is. The pen scratch and the cricket chirs. It's warm and snug. I don't want to go. Well, there's nothing left for me but to say goodbye to you, my friends. To say goodbye to my table. And be off. But why are you in such a hurry? You might as well stay. I can't. I can't. Delivered two rubles, 79 kopecks. I'll look over it for horses already. Yes, I've had them. Here, take these, will you? Mind you don't crush the portfolio. Yes, sir. Well? When shall we see you again? Not before next summer, I expect. Hardly in the winter. Of course, if anything happens, you let me know and I'll come. Thank you for your hospitality, for your kindness, for everything, in fact. Goodbye, old woman. Well, you're not going without tea. <laughs> I don't want a dinner. Perhaps she'd like a drop of vodka. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, trace horse has gone a little lame. I noticed it yesterday when Petrushka was taking it to water. Try changing his shoes. <laughs> I have to stop at the blacksmith's in Rojdej Voroy. Can't be helped. I suppose in that Africa the heat must be something terrific now. Hmm? <laughs> yes, I suppose so. You are. For your good health, my dear. You should eat some bread with it. I like it as it is. Now, good luck to you all. Don't you come out, nurse. There's no need. Phew. February the 2nd. Lent and oil, 20 pounds. February the 16th. Lenten oil, 20 pounds. Ah, buckwheat. Ah, oh, he's gone. Yes. 
total 15 25 chain of days and weary evenings. We shall patiently bear the trials which fate sends us. We shall work for others both now and shall We shall say that we have suffered, that we have wept, and that life has been bitter to us. And God will have pity on us. And you and I, uncle, dear uncle, shall see a light that is bright and lovely and beautiful. We shall rejoice and look back on these troubles of ours with tenderness, with a smile, and we shall rest. I have faith, uncle. I have fervent, passionate faith. We shall rest. We shall hear the angels. We shall see all heaven lit with radiance. We shall see all earthly evil, all our suffering, drowned in mercy which will fill the whole world. And our life will be peaceful, gentle, and sweet as a caress. I have faith, uncle. I have faith. Oh, poor Uncle Vanya. You're crying. You have had no joy in your life. But wait, uncle. Wait. We shall rest. We shall rest. We shall rest. 